I'm doing this video as an open letter to LG to talk about their A9 product and development and what could be changed in the future with your vacuum cleaners. You have the basis of a wonderful machine with plenty of power. Now who am I? I am known as Performance Reviews on YouTube and I'm not just some guy who just reviews or fixes vacuum cleaners. To give you a little bit of my background, yes I did fix vacuum cleaners and run vacuum shops for about 16 years. I actually grew up in a manual machine shop and currently my family owns a business where we manufacture things not only by hand but we make a lot of prototypes and do a lot of development along with working with big manufacturers to develop products. Uh, my family we own several patents on various things in the tactical world mainly um, tech lock things like that uh, so that that's my background and why I, I feel like my input might be valuable to you want to talk about one of the strongest things which was the power of this cordless vacuum it was by far the most powerful cordless vacuum I tested to date and I use a process of what they call a working vacuum gauge. This is actually for testing central vacuums to see if they can run a air turbine head it is the original purpose of this gauge, but it's become an industry standard thing here in the United States and it gives a great deal of information. Not only your sealed vacuum, but that working vacuum uh, tests the ability to deliver whether that vacuum actually is being gone through an efficient airflow path and getting to the tools. So it's an invaluable tool I found in terms of testing machines. You can use CFM and uh, sealed vacuum and all sorts of other things, but I, I have found this to be the most relevant and quick way to evaluate the power of a machine. Now one thing I noticed I found really peculiar is you gave the machine two low settings. Uh, the low setting really isn't useful. It really just isn't. I know you're trying to beef up those battery uh, runtime numbers, but I, w I would suggest giving the machine a medium power setting, um, something so it would have about 20 inches of working vacuum. And right right now, your maximum power setting is something like 35 inches of working vacuum. So again, a medium setting, and then your lowest setting has like 10 inches, which isn't enough actually to bring debris out of that head, out of a carpet or hard floor. So giving it a medium setting, you might be able to have good numbers and extend the usability of the vacuum cleaner to the customer and this would be a quick software tweak from my understanding that you guys could make. The next thing I want to talk about the button placement which is much better than the competition. Uh, placement's great. One thing I would do is instead of having to hold it to get on boost if you could just hit the plus arrow to get to that third setting or those settings and go through the buttons just with the plus or minus that would be a great uh, improvement. I want to talk ergonomics and grip. You did a great thing by not putting a trigger on the vacuum, but you did put this notch, and this notch is reminiscent. This notch is reminiscent of an M16 handguard, which they have removed that notch because it doesn't fit all hands. Big or small both have problems with notches like that. There's actually a whole aftermarket for hand grips that don't have that notch to retrofit weapons, and I think these hand grips could be applied to your vacuums. There's two things that are really important about this grip I'm showing you. The first is that it doesn't have that notch so it fits every hand. The second thing, second thing is that texture on that grip allows you to mold in the texture and the feel good of the grip without having to put another rubber piece. This cuts down on manufacturing costs. It also adds durability. These rubber pieces, after about a year or two, they go to shit, they peel off, they dry out, they come off the unit. You could end up with a costly warranty uh, claims involving this grip. So like I said, remove it and go to something like a texture. I highly recommend you take a look at what Magpul has done with ergonomics. The next thing is the app development. That's robbing battery life. There's no reason to have Wi-Fi or Bluetooth in a vacuum cleaner. Uh, I know the competition's done it, but it really does seem pointless and a waste of perfectly good battery. Now, if for some reason you're using this app to do market research on the customers, then I, I could understand keeping that in, but I would I would personally remove it unless you're getting wonderful market research from spying on your customers with this. 
The next thing to talk about is weight. You guys nailed the weight for a handheld vacuum, though it's very top heavy. And that is something that we're seeing shift in the industry. So this was a quick broom that another appliance company by the name of Mila, I'm sure you're familiar with them, uh, they actually developed this product, I want to say in the 50s at some time. And it was a plug-in product, but it was a good idea in terms of you could move the motor around either to the top or the bottom, depending on whether you need the wand or the floor tool, etc. Another complicated rendition I've seen of this is the lift-away concept. Uh, first thought of by Bissell in the 90s and was very troublesome. Hoover had trouble with it, but it was an interesting concept. But again, you see the weight put down low mostly, but using the hose or being able to lift the machine off when you use the tools uh, is a very practical concept to the consumer, but hard to execute and a manufacturing nightmare. Now this year at the VDTA, we saw the Triflex come out, which was a really ingenious idea because it allowed the wand to be configured and the motor to be configured how the user wanted it. Now it's big, bulky, and underpowered, but your bagless technology along with your motor technology and battery technology in this sort of package would lend itself very well. Now I, again, got to play with pre-production prototypes at the VDTA, so I really was disappointed with the power in this product, but again, I feel you have the technology to execute this product well, and that gives you advantage over the competition. One of the biggest problems with the Dyson the biggest problem with Dyson and some of the competition, who you all seem to be copying each other at this point, uh, is you're putting all the weight up high and the bin's too small, so you make the bin bigger, the battery's too small, so you make the battery bigger, and soon you have a 10-pound stick vacuum that is unusable except for the most physically fit of us. So my wife refuses to use anything like this, and that entails the problem. So what? how do you get the weight? Do you make a stick vacuum like this Triflex where you put the weight down low and have a configurable wand, which is a lot to manufacture, but it's doable. This is a Mila Art. This is a great example of a stick vacuum. Failed because it was marketed wrong, uh, but it is a fabulous stick vacuum. Um, what makes this fabulous is not only the angle of which it maneuvers, but it is put 90% of the weight out of the hands of the users by still making the nozzle usable to get under most things. So that makes it very unique. And this did have a convertible style hose in the handle as well. So that was a very interesting thing. I do have a video on this if you want to see a full demo, but I wanted to show something uh, that you may not have seen in terms of stick vacuums, but this was a good idea Another way of doing it, again, this is an Electrolux or AEG product, depending on your country. This also put a rotating brush and a cleaner head all the weight down low with the skeletonized handle up top. This, again, saw limited success, but due to marketing. Now, the thing all, both of these cleaners have in common is they were plug-in. We now have the battery technology and the motor technology, particularly ULG, to make something like this that is not a plug-in, and I think you might find the market would be more accepting of a machine like this I think like the most now. obvious answer is going to a canister vacuum. Uh, the problem with that is markability in certain regions. Certain people don't like canisters, but again, if you look different, you're gonna stand out. So maybe if demoed properly on the weekends at certain big box stores, an aggressive advertising campaign might make this work. Now, I was looking at your canisters, and I, could give you a lot of input about that. I see better design in this sort of thing, uh, the hose low, but again you're still using the two back wheels which don't maneuver as well as having full on casters, the low mounted hose like I said. Uh, but this is an interesting concept and I, I've seen a few videos on this and if you marketed this with the right electric power nozzle to the United States it might sell. Uh, in limited numbers, but it'd be an interesting concept to see this uh, cordless bagless canister come with the power head to the United States and go to the higher end market. Again, part of the problem with marketing canisters is companies like Pneumatic marketed a great product, very maneuverable, sh much shorter wheelbase than you use, uh, so it maneuvers well, but without an electric power head, 
it would be forever doomed. So definitely take a look and consider marketing a full-size power head or even a switchable floor tool would be marketable if they have bare floor and area rugs, but really having that electric head seems to be a selling feature for a lot of Americans. I would like you to take a good look at this nozzle because this has been equipped on more vacuums than I can name. Having just a straight suction floor tool is invaluable. Um, with just brushes or squeegees, I actually think squeegees might be the way to go. Squeegees cost less to manufacture and squeegees don't have pet hair. They can get caught on them easily. But having some sort of floor tool option like this with your stick vacuums not only cuts manufacturing costs but it will generally work better again if you put that medium setting or on there that will really complement something like this nice now you could go to Vissel work and make one I know you guys are really big into making everything in-house and there are plenty of good designs that are not patented that you could copy and put into action why we're on the subject of floor heads there are a couple changes you can make to your floor head that would make it better suited to the American market and to the market in general. Um, well, the first would be either adding some bigger wheels to the machine and then adding what they call a gate system or a vent for what they call the Venturian effect. This zero-g nozzle to the right is an example of what I'm talking about. It has a gate that you can open up. That way when you bring it on higher pile carpet or if the machine becomes hard to push because the customer has it on the wrong setting or something. Uh, it's a quick solution to just add holes in the head uh, to make it push easier on soft pile or frigé or shag type carpets. Um, as far as making it wider, I don't really see that to be necessary. You could offer an XL, but I really don't see that to be as a big a deal as adding either vents or a self-adjustment type of mechanism where you can have a carpet height mechanism where it goes up and down. We're on my workbench and I want to explain some very simple types of carpet height adjustment that you could add to the back of your nozzle. This is one that the Hoover convertible in Decade 80 used and it's really effective. It's just a lever. You can move it up like this. You could do this as a screw adjustment too as well and I'll show you mechanically how this works. Again, this is very, very, very simple um, in terms of how you would implement this, but you see this just slides on a cam system uh, right there. And having that bit of adjustment makes a huge difference, especially with houses with wall-to-wall -wall carpet, or even if you're trying to get bigger objects on hard floor, and I'm going to show you what it does to the nozzle. At this angle, it's really apparent in terms of how it lifts and manipulates the nozzle. Here we see the same concept done with the Eureka. This time, the knob is the cam. It's, again, extremely cheap to manufacture. And if I can bring it upside down for you, I'll show you how that works. Again, very simple height adjustment. Now the next is the one I would personally implement on your machine, and this is an Electrolux design. Don't worry boys, the patent's up on this. And this allows the head to self-adjust depending on the carpet. Again, it's hard to do but off the vacuum, but you get the idea that the head moves. And this is done with springs and an eccentric axle. So very simple, very compact. Having one or two of these on the back of your nozzle would make a huge difference, and then you just have static front wheels. I think this would be the most cost-effective solution with how your nozzle is set up currently. Another design, this time by the Germans, this is a vessel work design executed with Mila. And what this is, is a continuous cam. This is very complicated to manufacture, but again, it's accomplishing that same thing of raising and lowering the head. Uh, again, you see this eccentric uh, axle here moving those wheels up and down accordingly. So putting some sort of height adjustment on your nozzle would be welcome. Now on to vessel work. Uh, another thing I noticed about your nozzle is it's hard to push it under beds. Vessel work got the angle by putting it at this 45 degree angle. You can go a little bit steeper, but you don't probably want to go to a full 90. 60s are right too. I've seen that done on SIBO. Um, 
but having this allows you to still push it forward and back without it flopping around. I'm going to talk dusting brushes. Um, you guys seem to have recycled the dusting brush from the DC24 Dyson, later to be used on the stick vacuums, and it's a really piss-poor dusting brush unless you're hold, holding the vacuum in your hand uh, and using it at an angle like such. Having a dusting brush with this angle, very traditional, you'll find this on hundreds if not thousands of different models. This is good. It's basic, it's good, it's commercially available if you don't want to make it in-house. This is a little bit more creative, uh, but I think it might be more of an LG solution, looking at how you guys like to innovate, which is putting some sort of swivel neck on your dusting brush with reference points. So this actually clicks into four places. Um, this one has double joints on it, but a single joint is just fine as well. So I think that would be a big improvement in terms of usability with your vacuum. And again, you'd be kneecapping the competition that's using that stupid tool that Dyson uses. All right, I want you to pay attention here because this is a problem, especially if you live in an apartment complex or a bigger house where you have to go up or down an elevator to get outside to empty this thing. You would never empty this in-house. It puts too much dirt back in the air. And this defeats the purpose of really even having a filter on the vacuum in the first place when you have to touch it, the dirt. Then you become the vacuum cleaner. This is a complaint by a lot of consumers, but it's often overlooked due to the lack of options on the market. I think you're going to go with this suggestion, but I do want to talk about it. These are both vacuum bags made by a company called Brano Filter. Uh, and in terms of maintenance and vacuum cleaners, being able to just do that and change the bag with the synthetic bag is so much easier. And again, consumers, especially high-end consumers, that above the $500 mark are going for this solution. And Brano Filter is making the bags for just about all of those. Again, you can make these in-house. There are numerous Chinese manufacturers that make these, but these high-flow HEPA bags with some sort of seal-up, doesn't have to be self-sealing, uh, really are the way to go. And they're a lot more economical than trying to have to wash your, your vacuum every time. I think you guys did a great thing by including a spare pre-motor filter. I think you should uh, really emphasize on changing that HEPA filter you guys have as well. Um, but really, looking at your cyclone design, there is enough room to fit some sort of bag chamber in there. It would be smaller, but I think you would find that consumers would be open to this more than your market research shows. I do want to note, whoever's idea it was to take the crevice tool and use it as your cyclone tool, please give that person a raise. That person was really thinking, so good job with that. I also want to say these laminated quick start guide cards, these how-to common question cards are a brilliant idea. Please keep those up on everything you do. I noticed the storage situation is a little bit different from model to model, and I see where you put extra tool storage on the base here with the two cleaner head model. I'd like to suggest a simple solution is that right there where I just pointed that you move the tools down both the crevice tool and the upholstery tool down and actually mold them into the base and then use the existing port for one more tool like the power punch nozzle. Well thanks for watching and listening to my product suggestions on the development of your cordless vacuum. You have made a fantastic cordless vacuum, and I look forward to seeing the next one have some improvements on it. Uh, feel free to reach out to me if you want some prototype testing or have any questions about this video.